Hi, everyone, again. Thank you for joining. And uh, uh, we are starting our Corporate Venture Builder online conference. And uh, for those who don't remember, my name is Max. Maybe you don't remember my name, but you'll definitely remember my nunchucks. Oh, wow. Yeah, we can start now. So I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, I built three bootstrap profitable companies. Last year, I published a paper on Venture Studios. It attracted a lot of attention from studios worldwide. And we already had um, organized five online conferences. Three were for Venture Studios. Uh, one was for um, VC fund managers, GPEs and LPs. And our last one was for family offices. Uh, because we want to build a lot of relationships with family offices. They are one of the main investors in Venture Studios. And uh, we plan to organize uh, meetings between studios and family offices. Uh, next week, we'll have uh, Investor Day with some studios pitching uh, from our uh, community called Venture Studio Family. Uh, yeah, and also we, have, uh, we are doing um, research on Venture Studios this year. Uh, so Maxi Mali, a PhD in our team, uh, is co-leading this uh, research because uh, the current data on studios is has some drawbacks. We found six problems with current data. Uh, and we now have more than 10 contributors and sponsors. Uh, contributors help to uh, get data on accelerator studios, uh, precede funds, and we are, we are planning to create a trustworthy uh, research. At least we'll try our best to do it uh, this year. So if you want to learn more or join, uh, I'll send you uh, the link now uh, where you can learn more about our research if you are hearing about it the first time. When I published my paper on studios last year, uh, many people asked me, what do I think about uh, corporate venture studios? Uh, to be honest, I didn't look uh, deeply into the different uh, corporate venture building models. I recorded some podcasts, uh, but uh, not many of them were published. Uh, and today I will learn together with you about what are different corporate uh, studios, uh, what is the models, how they partner with corporations, what are the challenges. Uh, and uh, yeah, this conference, it wasn't possible without my team. I want to thank my team. Uh, Masha, Annie, Roman, and Maxim. Uh, and Annie is organizing this conference together. This is why uh, we have to say thank you, Annie. Uh, and yeah, please, Annie, what we'll have today. Thank you, Max. Uh, welcome to our Corporate Venture Builder online conference. Uh, yes, my name is Annie, and I'm really excited to step in as your host today. Thank you to our amazing eight speakers and everyone who is here live now. And also thank you uh, for your help spreading the word about the conference. Uh, with your support, we are connecting Venture Studios together and creating a space for collaborative growth. Thank you. That's amazing. So our sub theme today is across borders. And I think that it's really incredible that we're able to meet online at the same time with people from all parts of the world. So I suggest you to begin our networking in the chat and please write right now uh, what country you're in right now. So let's see how much we're spread across the globe at the moment. So in the spirit of our Across Borders uh, theme, uh, some of our speakers will offer tips on working together across borders, highlight opportunities in Europe and show how the CVB model can be applied into emerging markets. Also, our group photo today will be dedicated to this topic. And uh, a bit later, I will ask you to prepare an item that represents your country. For example, I will be posing with this cute teacup because I'm in Turkey. And also, we have a really nice heartfelt activity today, which is the postcard exchange. So stay tuned. We will tell you more a little bit later. So today at the conference, we'll dive into what makes corporate startup collaboration work. We will reveal strategies and business models behind successful corporate studios, discuss challenges of corporate venture building, and much more. And I'm really excited to dive in and let's start with our first speaker. I will introduce Serge Dupont, uh, the Director of Foresight, Innovation, and AI Transformation Growth at Creative Doc, which is a corporate venture builder with 11 years of experience 
experience and the track record of 100 plus successful ventures. Serge has both corporate and entrepreneurial experience across Europe, Asia, and Africa. He's worked at Creative Docs for the Doc for the last six years, where he led ventures from idea to scale on behalf of large corporations. And Serge, Serge will tell us about the business model behind a successful corporate studio. So, Serge, the stage is yours, please. Yes, thank you, Annie. Thank you. No pressure on me. Yeah, no pressure on me. So, thank you, Annie. Thank you, Max. And thanks for the opportunity to share the experience. So, uh, let's just be precise. Uh, successful, what we mean by successful. Yeah. So, I will present you who we are, what we do. And then I'll, um, I have prepared like a few slides, um, but I will try to leave space for, for discussion and any question. This is a picture of our office in Prague, actually. Uh, it's quite famous building in the center of Prague, looking at the river. Uh, creative doc. Um, so what we do is corporate venture building. So 100% of our activity, and I will explain that it changed a bit from the beginning, but at the moment, 100% of our activity is to develop uh, venture, build venture, scale venture, and operate venture on behalf of corporate. So just a bit of uh, information about creative doc. So we exist for 12 years now. Uh, we have four offices, one in Prague, historically, the headquarters now is in Zurich. Uh, we have an office in Berlin, and then we have an office in Riyadh in Saudi. Yeah? So we are usually covering those four those four countries with people. But uh, in terms of uh, capacity to launch product, uh, I put a map. Uh, so everything which is green, it's a place where we've been launching product for our corporate uh, corporate client. Um, we launch around hundred plus uh, venture. If right away you ask me what is the uh, uh, conversion rate or success rate. I think we are around, last time I was calculating, I think around 78, 80%. Uh, what I mean by that is once we launch them on the, on the market, if you ask me how many survive and, and are profitable, then we are around 78, 80%. Again, I'll let you judge if you think it's a good numbers or not. We're quite proud of the numbers, um, at the moment. In terms of people, uh, now we are around 540, 550 people, uh, under one roof. I will also explain later why we have decided to bring all the people under one roof rather than to work with external uh, people. Um, and let's move on the, on the right part. Uh, you see a couple of, of brands. Basically, over the last three years, we acquired four companies. So we acquired four uh, different type of uh, corporate venture building. Uh, they were different country, different skills. I will explain later. And we, inquire, uh, we acquired that uh, for the last three years. What we do, I think this is, should be no surprise uh, for uh, the majority of, uh, of the audience. Um, on the upper part, maybe what is quite specific about Creative Doc, uh, you see the orange box, which is called Foresight and Strategy. So we acquire a company called Robert Hager based in Berlin two and a half years ago. And they are quite specialized in this, um, in this uh, technology, which is looking at potential trends, uh, signal, build scenario for the future, and based on the scenario to identify what could be the opportunity. The reason we, uh, we decided to join the force with them is actually, it's a very useful and powerful to plug this, uh, this activity and this expertise at the beginning of the of the journey of building a startup. So you don't only build the startup with the needs of now, but trying to make sure and de-risk the investment by making sure that it's going to be the needs of the future, or whatever is the sector of activity, whatever is the, the, the target group. So we offer from the full site to the venture design, bring to market, scale, operating. And given the fact that we have this experience, then we have a couple of clients that ask us to build a small creative doc. So we call it Venture Studio, uh, Basically, we are bringing the technology, the process, we are hiring the people for them. We train them, we do a couple of projects with them, and then we let them uh, live their life with their corporate studio. Uh, for example, we did one for Skoda, for the one who likes cars. So this is the Czech brand of Volkswagen. So we basically, seven years ago, we created a small creative doc uh, for them. And then the last part is basically the AI transformation. I think everyone's talking about this. Um, First, we started to apply to us, so we transform our own um, expertise uh, and ability to, to run venture design and foresight through the AI transformation. And once we felt confident that we know what we're talking about and what uh, could be very interesting for our client, then we started to offer it uh, to our corporate client. So this is, in I think, two minutes, who we are, what we do. And now I'm going to uh, try to describe why we think we are 
uh, we are a bit specific, maybe to compare to some of you. Maybe I didn't mention, if you want to know some of the numbers, I didn't write there, but uh, the turnover of Creative Dog this year should be around 50 million euros. Uh, we don't have any equity, so we do not invest into uh, startups. So when I talk about 50 million, this is the revenue we generate from the cooperation with, uh, with the corporate. Again, let you judge if, if you think it's a good number, not good number. So the first thing is uh, what makes us unique, I believe, is the experience. 12 years on the market. Um, at that time, I think we were among the first one to, to bring uh, this idea of the corporate venture building. Uh, the size, 500 people and the market reach. Um, obviously, when, when we discuss with our partner, with our client, uh, they always have in mind this scaling ability. Uh, for them, it's quite important to have under one roof same people that can scale from, I don't know, from uh, Germany to um, Middle East, uh, to the rest of Europe, to US, to Australia. So this is the capability that we are bringing them. And I think that makes a difference, not, not for every client, but I think for a lot of clients, they, they like this kind of stability and this ability to, uh, to basically uh, scale it. Second one is the, the fact that we integrate, I think it was five years ago, um, so after I joined the company, we used to have all technical, for example, all the tech part was outsourced. Um, the data part was outsourced. We were using an external um, digital marketing studio. And for some reason, we at Creative Lab, we did not manage to make it work. It was, it was complicated. We didn't have the right commitment from the team. We didn't have uh, the right flexibility. Give you an example, when we were bringing external tech people to deliver a uh, uh, digital product, their goals was to deliver a line of code, you know, make it short, but line of code. Where now with the people in the team, in-house with us, their job is not the line of code, it's actually to deliver a product. So they have this visibility, they have this commitment and responsibility not to deliver a piece of it, but they need to deliver the product and the product that we'll be running. So, um, so five years ago, we decided to integrate all of them. That's the reason we have 500 people. Um, I think today we have around 120, 130 tech people. So from front-end, back-end developer, um, IT architect, and so on, we have around 25 to 30 data scientists, AI experts. We have our own digital studio um, that help us as a creative doc, as a brand, but they are mostly dedicated to our startups from the initial uh, testing phase to the go to market. So we do everything internally. So that's, that's, I think, a, a big difference. And as I mentioned, I don't know, maybe you will tell me I'm wrong, but I don't know any corporate venture studio that has the foresight ability. Again, we didn't have it. We took it from externally and then we fully integrated. So having an in house capacity for us, it's, it's, it's unique and I think it's a big plus. Efficiency, again, 12 years on the market, and we try, we're not a SaaS company, yeah? so, but we try to repeat and reuse some of the uh, component uh, that we have uh, from the shelf. Um, 11 years ago, we started with the banking sector, so we did a lot of uh, consumer loans, uh, risk scoring model, and then we have those technical tech bricks uh, at our disposal. So whenever we will, for example, now we're doing a large project for, um, I see some people are from Middle East, so for Oredu, uh, the large telecommunications. So we are bringing them the fintech, um, the fintech solution to their, I think they have 160 million uh, users. So we are delivering the tech part, uh, the, the fintech part, sorry, of their solution. Obviously, we reuse also some of the component that we have developed from the past. Uh, for the AI transformation, for us first, and now we're delivering to our client, we start to use um, AI platform uh, that help actually to optimize and uh, automatize the creation of a chatbot. Uh, so this is what we try to do, make a project, try to create some, uh, some tech bricks and then reuse it as much as possible after. Business model, um, as I mentioned, long-term commitment, um, meaning that from day one, and I think that makes a good difference for our client from day one, meaning from the foresight moment, from the design moment, we have in mind that we're going to run the project and we're going to be accountable for, to work, for what we are delivering in the early phase. And it might sound a bit uh, just like a, a wording, but 
the mindset is completely different. What I mean by that is at the end of the testing phase that I was presenting, validation, you bring a business case. But then you have to be responsible for that business case. And I know, I know a lot of uh, studios that actually, they do the initial phase, they bring an MVP into the market, the prototype, they draw a fantastic business case, and they escape. Yeah, meaning we deliver everything. If there is a problem, that's not our fault. Uh, we at Creative Doc, we, we decided to take more risk. Um, and then we go into the direction that we have to operate it. Yeah, doing a project for Veolia, for example, me personally, for the last four years, every month I'm going to the steering committee presenting against the business case that we, we, we propose. Yeah, I think this, this, this is quite important. And the other thing which is important is very often in the past, we were used to have equity. So we were using uh, uh, our own cash uh, to invest into some of the studio and then and some of the venture. And then we decided to, to change the model. Now we do not invest anymore. But then we understand that our partners, our clients, they wanted us to have a skin in the game, to take a risk. And then we transform the equity part into KPIs, which are aligned with the business case and success fee, meaning that the majority of our margin and revenue is coming from the success fee and the KPIs that we achieve. So we answer the corporate problem or challenge, which is, guys, you don't take risk, but we didn't answer through the equity. And the reason we did that, actually, is because we wanted to invest into the company. We wanted to invest into the expertise of the people. We wanted to acquire new company and competency. And because we are an uh, independent company, yeah, we have few shareholders. I'm one of them. Actually, um, we are no strategic investor. We have no VC. As of today, maybe the future will change. So basically, it's our own money that we are reinvesting into um, into the people, into uh, acquiring a company. And just before the call, I heard from my from my uh, chairman that actually we will acquire another company in Germany that will be official in, in probably one week or two weeks. So this is very in the in the short time what I think made us different. Uh, I believe. Um, we are not the only one in this situation. Um, and to give you an idea, um, given the size, the range, as I said, we do a project in the Middle East, we do a lot in Europe, obviously. Now we are invited to the table of um, tender or RFP that we were not invited in the past. So if you ask me what are the competition I have in front of me at the moment, even so, I think those guys doing different business, but it would be digital, uh, it would be BCG, it would be Bain. Uh, those are the type of player that were in front of us at the moment. Three, four years ago, we were not invited at the table to discuss this because I think we were not structured, we're not big enough, we didn't have enough track record. This is where we are at the moment. Um, so, Annie, I don't know how much time do I have left, but I would rather leave the space for question uh, rather than to continue to talk. Uh, yes, yeah, sir, I will ask some, some questions. So, um, how did you get your first corporate partner? Uh, if you know the story, I, I'm not sure when you joined. Yes, yes, yeah. Actually, the uh, the the founder. So, I'm I'm in the company for six and a half years, and the company exists for for twelve years now. Um, the first client was actually so the founder was uh, from the telecom. Interesting enough, I think a lot of people that develop a, a, a corporate studio and venture studio are coming from the telecom because at that time that was one of the leading industry in terms of innovation. And um, they actually had one client uh, that wanted to create a consumer loans in China. So that was the first, that was the first project that we did uh, uh, in, that, uh, in that direction. But it was not mean to do a repetition of it. It was just, okay, can you come and create this one and run it? And then it was successful. And then they decided to, uh, Martin, the founder, decided to uh, actually make it his, uh, his next 10 years or 15 years job. Mm -hmm. And with, with how many corporations? So you launched like more than 100 companies. And uh, yeah. how, many how many companies are pure one corporation? So are those repeat customers uh, or each time you companies? Yeah, I mean, yeah, no, I would say that's a good question. I think we probably have 70%, yeah, 70% uh, which are independent or individuals. The rest are the one, um, for example, we I cannot name name it, but we, we are helping a, a large international tobacco company to move from uh, burning combustion 
tobacco to uh, non-commissioned tobacco and uh, tobacco. And actually, uh, for them, we are creating, uh, I think, five or six uh, venture. Yeah. But uh, normally, it's independent individual. Uh, large company individual want to develop uh, a lot of venture. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, and uh, usually, um, usually you don't plan to exit companies so to to sell them. So your customers just want to that you will build companies for them. So my question is, did you have some exits? Uh, and then, like, do you transfer the company for your corporation? If I understand right, uh, there are no external co-founders like entrepreneurs who also get shares uh, or get equity in the company. No, no. I mean, we, we have some exception, uh, Max. But the, the business model is initial phase, uh, foresight, foresight and design. So before we know what we're going to build, um, and usually MVP is under creative dog. So we have a couple of uh, vehicles that can hold uh the, the the company or the product um but there is always a contract that this is belong to the to the client yeah so they, they can buy buy back for once it's validated then uh we have three options fully integrated into the client um or a spin-off meaning that they will be looking for uh, additional investor usually it's not vc but stvc um or it would be a standalone that will belong 100 percent to uh to the client yeah, mm -hmm. so that's the way we do. We de-risk the at the beginning, and then we put it public. Uh, but uh, and in terms of equity, no, we yeah, we don't we don't do that. We exit, for example, uh, one insurance uh, uh, a startup that we had that was our own uh, uh, venture or own startup, and then we sold it to uh, Société Générale, uh, the insurance arm of Société Générale in France. Mm, okay. Yeah. Thank you, Serge. Uh, for your presentation and for your answers. You have some more uh, questions in the chat. So go there and ask I will try them. to answer, yes. <laughs> and feel free to contact me on, on LinkedIn again. 10 minutes is, is very quick, but I just wanted to give a, uh, just give a, a highlight of, uh, of... And of course, when you look at the journey, it was not linear. Yeah, it, it was a lot of up and as down, always, you can imagine. Yes, with many yeah. startups and venture studios. Yeah, okay. good. Great. Thank you so much, Serge and Max. Thank you also. Max will be helping me today with Q&A sessions. But now I'm really excited to introduce you to our second speaker. This is Matthew Brady, the Managing Director of High Alpha Innovation. After pioneering the Venture Studio model, High Alpha launched High Alpha Innovation to bring the advantages of the Venture Studio model to large corporations. And in the last three years, uh, they launched close to 20 companies and have conducted extensive studies on Venture Studios and various approaches, identifying several common failure modes in venture building. So today, Matthew will share insights on how to avoid common failure modes in corporate venture building. Hey, uh, hello, everyone. And thank you, Annie. Uh, it's great to, to be here today. Um, I'm sure that this conference will be filled with a lot of optimism and excitement for the model. Uh, I have uh, the unenviable job of, of bringing a little bit of pessimism to our discussion and talking a little bit about some of the failure modes that do exist in the world of, of uh, corporate venture studio. Um, first, before I uh, uh, put my, my, my pessimistic glasses on, I, I do want to just introduce myself very briefly and, and talk a little bit about the work that we do. Uh, obviously, Matt Brady, I'm a managing director with High Alpha Innovation. I help lead one uh, sector of our business that is focused on the partnerships that we create between corporations, uh, universities, and, and increasingly municipalities within the United States, uh, bringing the venture studio model to others. Uh, my background is actually in corporate strategy and innovation. Um, I've only been working within venture capital for the last three years. Before that, I was a partner at a strategy and growth consultancy called Innosite that was founded by Harvard Business School professor Clay Christensen. Um, Clay coined the term disruptive innovation, uh, talked a lot about the innovator's dilemma, and I think that his theories are extremely relevant to the world of venture studio, certainly the world of corporate venture studio. And so I'm going to take some of uh, his lessons and um, sprinkle them throughout some of the some of the failure modes that that I'll be talking about today. Um, beyond that, uh, married with with three kids, I live outside of Boston, Massachusetts, in the United States. Just a word on high uh, high alpha and high alpha innovation. Um, High Alpha helps pioneer the, the Venture Studio model launched back in 2015. Um, uh, they, they, over time, also grew out a capital arm. Um, they've been very active, uh, certainly within the U.S. space, to uh, evangelize the Venture Studio model. Uh, and they've been quite successful. 
uh, a funny thing happened uh, along the way, which was corporations started to come to High Alpha and ask how they could tap into a model like this. They loved the idea of identifying problems, uh, problems that could be solved through startup creation. And they wondered how you know, High Alpha was able to do so on a repeated basis. Um, ever the entrepreneurs, uh, the High Alpha team launched High Alpha Innovation, which is the organization that I'm a member of. Um, High Alpha Innovation uh, focuses entirely on external partnerships. Uh, we do not launch companies on our own. Um, we do not launch companies for our own benefit. We, 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 we serve uh, other organizations, large organizations like corporations, universities, and, and municipalities, as I said. Um, we, we, are, we are trying to scale these services uh, within the U.S. market for those who are interested in tapping into the powerful model of startup creation. Um, just to, to, br to bring a little bit of uh, Clay's perspective here, the, the, the common theme that we see across corporations, universities, and governments is that they are all trying to use this model to overcome some form of the innovator's dilemma. So what is the innovator's dilemma? Um, in its simplest form, uh, the corporations, uh, the leaders of, of their spaces got really good at what they do uh, because they were able to focus on the core business. But it's that focus on the core business that actually precludes them from making advancements, uh, really challenges them uh, at doing anything that is new. Uh, simply put, the antibodies of the core business often come out and disrupt or, or, or stifle anything that is even adjacent or, or transformational, certainly. And many corporations we are, we are seeing uh, recognize that. And they view uh, a startup creation as a logical endpoint, uh, a logical way to protect the new by removing them from the corporation itself. Uh, safeguarding them from some of the antibodies that exist within a very successful and thriving corporation. There are similar, um, there are similar uh, innovators' dilemma uh, 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 operations at work within universities and, and even within governments, which might be counterintuitive. But for example, the, the core business of a university is to research and to teach. And consequently, the um, success rate of startups coming out of universities, at least within the United States, is surprisingly low. Um, the, these are these are areas, uh, organizations that should be absolutely fantastic at launching startups, but struggle to do so. Again, the the gravity, the conflict with the core business is, is usually what is at play here, and our model helps overcome some of that. But now I will I will be a little bit of the pessimist here and, and talk about some of the common failure modes that we've observed. Um, certainly, with with regard to working with corporations, but there there are absolutely parallel in the university space uh, as well, which is, is interesting. Um, just in, 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 in the spirit of starting with the answer in mind, uh, I've, I've categorized some of the, the big failure modes that we have observed. Um, these are failure modes that could exist within the corporation itself uh, or within some sort of a spun out entity that is, that is either working with a venture studio or is actually sponsoring a venture studio itself or building a capability itself. Um, if we're being honest, uh, the entire world of corporate innovation is on shaky ground. Uh, um, it's, it's, it's an unstable place to be and to operate. Um, innovation teams, even at the absolute largest corporations in the world, are always one market blip away or one leadership change away from being eliminated. And I think uh, it would be naive if we were to, to, to think that the venture studio model uh, in and of itself would solve for any of that. In fact, um, the fact uh, the, of launching startups might make things um, even more acute, um, it might make some of the risks and failure modes even more acute than more traditional uh, forms of corporate innovation. And so it's very important to, to go into these kinds of relationships with very clear eyes and an understanding of what could go wrong. The three big buckets that I, I put together for, for the conversation today are around the why, what, and how of a venture studio operation uh, with a corporation. Um, with why, it is extremely important to understand why it is that a corporation is pursuing startup creation in the first place. Um, more often than we would like to, to admit, uh, corporations sometimes find a new shiny model and they like to pursue it. Uh, that's certainly true of the venture studio model right now. 
And if, if the actions and the activities uh, of a venture studio effort are not directly linked to the enterprise, enterprise growth strategy of that organization, you are probably one or two years away from having a bad wake up call. Um, what we see so often is that innovation teams will launch efforts like uh, an accelerator or, or, or a studio. And over time, the core business starts to view it as a distraction. It starts to think about it as a competing priority, right? And as a result, um, it is eroded and, and, and oftentimes eliminated. So a linkage to the strategy is absolutely paramount. Second big question is around what types of business models that the venture studio should pursue. Um, it is easier to get leadership buy-in within a corporation if you are complementing the core directly, right? If you are saying part of our value proposition is we will help you do more, sell more, uh, accomplish more within the core business, that might get excitement going within the, the ranks of the C-suite. But uh, that is not usually the best spot for a startup itself. So there's a conflict there uh, between wanting to, to, to serve the needs of the corporation, but then trying to launch startups that are, are, are perhaps not ever going to leave the, um, the gravity of the organization itself. The last failure modes I have are around how. Um, how it is that the venture studios are pursued, how it is that they seek repeatable processes for, for startup creation. Um, the first is, is very much around a, a lack of a rigorous uh, process that, that drives clear forcing functions. We see all too often uh, what we call zombie projects uh, that exist within a corporation, um, uh, projects that just simply will not die. Um, and so you, you need to have processes in place that will that will deprioritize ideas that uh, you do not, do not think are resonating in the marketplace. Um, and another massive uh, failure mode that we see around how a venture studio is that corporations are not imbuing nearly enough advantage into the startups that they create. And there are some clear choices that, that corporations can make around how it is that they will support startups, uh, which we can talk about momentarily. I'm going to do a, a quick click on each one of these failure modes and just talk to you a bit about how we see the world. Um, and then we can open it up for questions uh, shortly thereafter. So on the first, again, I, I believe that it is absolutely paramount that the venture studio and the venture building efforts are directly linked to strategy of the corporation. Uh, otherwise, th there will be a lack of focus from uh, the partner entity itself. It could be what I've illustrated here is, is, is four common areas uh, at the absolute highest level, four common areas and problem, uh, uh, problem domains that, that we see corporations uh, trying to gain traction with them. Um, it could be that they're looking to, to strengthen or extend relationships with, with uh, customers by solving additional problems that their customers might face. Um, very often, it's a, it's a business problem that they, they, are, they are challenged by themselves. So you might have, for example, a consumer packaged goods company that, that, that has insights into supply chain issues. They themselves are not a supply chain company necessarily, but they are aware of market problems and they are looking to solve them. And in the process of solving them, uh, create, um, create opportunities for, for expanded growth uh, by a startup. Uh, similarly, there could, be, uh, there could be market problems that they are looking to solve. Uh, for example, um, uh, an unlock in the form of a, a new marketplace that, 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 that allows them to um, gain insight into uh, fundamentally new businesses. Or uh, in some cases, there are corporations that view startup creation as a true way to expand the business uh, down the road. Um, question of, of strategy itself, which is fairly meta, but question of how it is that we might grow, what is the future version of the corporation 10 to 20 years from now? How do we start planting the seeds? Um, these kinds of problem areas uh, are, are absolutely critical to get alignment from, from the corporation uh, that you are working with. Otherwise, again, uh, you, you are only uh, maybe a handful of weeks or certainly a handful of years away from being on unstable ground as the corporation loses, um, loses focus and starts to think of the venture studio as a competing priority within the organization. When, when we think about what it is that the venture studio should be focused on, we like to think through the lens of business model. Um, there are a lot of different ways to view a portfolio of, of innovation efforts um, across, a, across a corporation. 
Um, you know, you'll hear, hear McKinsey, for example, talking about horizon one, two, three. We like to talk about uh, core adjacent and transformational through, again, the, 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 the uh, juxtaposition of a business model and the market that, that it is that you're working in. I was just talking a moment ago about the need to link to strategy, but we need to keep in, uh, we need to keep in mind and, and, and uh, um, hold in tension that actually we believe that the venture studio model is most effective when it is pursuing true transformation. Right. So uh, our push with our corporate partners is to move as far away from the core as possible. Again, being complementary and being linked to their strategy, but trying to establish fundamentally new S curves for the company, um, things that can be entirely run uh, independent from the core. This is going to be one of the most important things that we can do to avoid common pitfall, pit, 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 falls. Sorry. Um, this is a, a, just a, a, a click onto the how. Uh, again, there needs to be forcing functions. This is just a snapshot of the process that we run. Everyone on this call will have a similar process. It's not rocket science. The key things to keep in mind here are that you are going from many ideas to few ideas, and you have to hold your feet to the flames and the corporate partner's feet to the flames, or, or you will have just a proliferation of ideas that do not die. So you have to build in um, a, a rigorous process, one that brings in forcing functions and, and, and allows you to uh, get down to the absolute most promising concepts, the ones that you believe are truly venture backable, uh, and leave the other things to either the core business or some adjacencies that perhaps they would like to pursue. Finally, uh, very important, um, I will just say that if the corporate sponsor is not advantaging the startup, they are disadvantaging the startup. Uh, too often, we see corporate studios launching startups um, using the carrot of we will be your first commercial relationship, but never making good on that promise. It actually acts as a millstone around the startup's neck. And so in, in, in terms of the, the list of different advantages that you could imbue, uh, commercial relationship is absolutely the strongest. The faster you are to revenue as a startup, of course, uh, the, most, the, the, the more successful you will be. Uh, bringing brand uh, recognition to the startup is also helpful. Acting as a channel partner, certainly acting as a fundraising um, kind of shepherd is useful. More often than not, we see corporations talking about the insights or expertise that they will bring. Those, those are good. It's nice to have, but those are not as strong as the corporation would believe. Um, so I, I know I've done a, 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 an absolute um, sprint through these different failure modes. I hope it wasn't too pessimistic. These are just some questions that we think are very important to keep in mind, starting with strategy and getting all the way down through tactics in order to see those, those venture studios and, and most importantly, the startups succeed and hopefully solve real world problems for customers. So thank you and I'll stop there. Thank you, Matt. I will ask only one question. Uh, so I know that Health Innovation has probably two ways of partnering with corporations. One is building startups for them and one is like launching a corporate venture builder. So can you elaborate on like, what is the difference between those two strategies and in what cases, what is better? What is your strategy in terms of developing Kyle for innovation. Great question. Um, if we were to think about a relationship linearly with, with either a corporation or a university, there, there are a lot of commonalities. Um, the instinct of a, of a corporation or a university is usually, hey, let's, let's test this out. Let's see what this model could do for us, which is a really smart way to think about it instead of just jumping headlong. Um, into, into, into launching a, a studio, for example, we will uh, operate pilots uh, with corporations and, and with universities so that they can get exposure to the venture studio model. We will try through that pilot to uh, launch maybe two startups together um, so that they can see what it's like to run water through the pipes. Many of our partners will intentionally and explicitly go into that pilot with um, the, the expectation that they will try to create a studio themselves. And that is fine with us. We are happy to help them build a capability and happy to evangelize the model. Um, however, more often than not, they say, actually, on second thought, um, why don't we just partner with you? There have been a number of long-term partnerships that we've established um, where, for example, we are actually helping them stand up a studio and then operate the studio itself. Um, don't reinvent the wheel. We can help you with that is kind of the attitude. Within the university space, interestingly, um, we have now launched a number of different studios and then also funds that ride alongside the studio and can be used to capitalize uh, whatever, um, whatever startups come off the, the conveyor belt of the, of the studio. And so we're starting to see an evolution from pilot 
to a longer term relationship to uh, to a to a very long term relationship of acting as a GP of funds for our partners that can be used to um, uh, launch as many startups as possible. Yeah, super, Matthew. Thank you very much. Uh, I also hope soon publish an interview with Elliot Parker. So he shared about your business model with details and numbers. So it will be interesting also to, for, for everyone here to listen. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, Matt. Uh, the interview with Elliot will be really soon. So please look out for that on our YouTube channel. So now let's have a little break and uh, let's create some memories. So it's the time for our group photo. I've asked you before in emails and in the post to prepare an item that represents the country that you're in right now. So it can be a tea or coffee mug with a local landmark, a piece of jewelry, a book by a local author, maybe even national currency. That is something that you should have at easy access or even a photo of some something famous, a famous place in your country. So you can get creative. Let's do a photo. So please hold an item and smile. Don't forget to smile. And please do it for 15 seconds because we need to make uh, good photos of, of every participant and we don't want to miss out. I see diff many different items. That's really interesting. I'm really looking forward to look into closer <laughs> after at the recording. Amazing. Thank you so much. I think that's enough. So we will share the photo on LinkedIn tomorrow. You can uh, you can see it there tomorrow. Bye-bye. So now uh, let's move on. I will introduce you to our next speaker. Uh, this is Juan Mantoya, founder and CEO of Rocker. Uh, Juan has worked on over 200 projects and helped co-build over 50 companies within the ecosystem, where he continues to play a part as an advisor and board member. Based on his extensive experience, Juan will tell us today about the different approaches to venture building and how it can propel both open innovation and entrepreneurship. Thanks for having us. Really happy to be here. I, I'm actually very, very interested in all the research you guys been doing and actually very thankful as well that somebody has been doing and it's amazing to hear. Chat today before we get into it, right? Um, we've also, we're based in Miami, Florida. I'm one of the co-founders and the current CEO. Uh, we've been around for about 12 years, which really makes us, I can't prove it, but it probably makes us one, one of the oldest venture builders around. As you can imagine, it's been a journey, right? And I think just to summarize it, in those 12 years, we've essentially built what we call our kind of uh, approach and methodology towards company building. We have and started and, and continue to do it, done it, uh, along with entrepreneurs in partnership. We build a portfolio of over 60 companies. Today, that portfolio has about 25. And we've even delved into acquiring some of those and running SPVs and different types of funds. Um, but we've also many years ago started offering this to corporates because we saw, as somebody else said before, that need, right? Um, they started coming to us and saying, hey, this is interesting. How can we use it to innovate, et cetera? And we started down that track very kind of shyly and learned a lot, right? And one of the things we've learned is uh, when it comes to venture building or corporate venture building, we look at it with a much broader lens, meaning... It's all about being the best innovation partner possible. And we've been through it enough times with some very large cor corporate, um, sorry, publicly traded companies, as well as smaller and regional companies across Latin America and the United States. So what we've seen is, you know, you have to customize the approach to your customer, right? And everybody can innovate even a little bit, but there's a lot of challenges, as, as Matt was saying. And we try to be kind of very agnostic and open up the definition, right? So... Our definition of venture building uh, goes into what we call venture building. All of us here call venture building, which is creating new startups or what McKinsey likes to call new business building for corporates. Uh, but it also spans what we call open innovation and accelerators and expands even corporate venture capital. We, as I said, have done pretty much all of them, uh, both for investors and corporations, meaning we've done SPVs and specific venture sort of vehicles for corporations. We've done accelerators, particularly in the blockchain space, where we work closely with two or three layer one blockchains running their accelerator programs uh, that are meant to grow their ecosystems. And we've done, obviously, more strategy and uh, venture building for large corporates, creating both uh, sort of internal startups that are then absorbed, or even ones that are spin off and, and, uh, and go on to have a life of their own, right? So a lot of these challenges Matt was mentioning and Serge was mentioning, we've, we've also kind of uh, gone through it. Uh, the presentation really focuses a little bit more on kind of like, I would call it venture building for beginners, right? So I think 
one of the things that I like to start with always is, you know, why would anybody do this? Um, and, and again, it was said before, you know, if this is done wrong, it can do more harm than good, right? And a lot of people do it because it's fashionable, because, you know, the CEO needs to see something, right? And it tends to fail because of it, right? Uh, but in, it's not, it doesn't make it less important, right? So like, one thing we always start with, and I'm going to try to go very quickly to it, is the world is changing pretty fast, right? Um, what we like to say is exponential technologies are accelerating tipping points, meaning change is happening faster than ever, right? So there's a few things I like to say always, but that always surprise me even when I say them, which uh, there were 11,000 years between the first, what we call agricultural revolution and the second one, right? There were only 257 between the steam engine and the moon landing. And it's only been roughly 17, year, 17 years between what we call the modern internet and a fully mapped uh, genome, uh, genome for humans, right? Uh, we could say 20 years ago, there was no generative AI. Now, it's not, there's not only generative AI, but it's fully available, publicly available, and basically unleashed on the world since maybe a year ago, right? So obviously, the world changes very quickly, and with it, change the precepts of how business work, what a corporation should or shouldn't do, whether they even should be any corporations, right? Like we don't know where things are going, but like uh, there's one of big uh, one of our big um, advisors who always likes to say the joke of you know uh, human longevity has increased more than ever. So has the average span of a marriage. What does it mean, right? Like can we really define marriage the same way anymore? And can we really expect to be together forever, right? So. I'll leave that question to him, but the whole point here is things change quickly. That changes underlying expectations. That changes the way people react with technology. That changes access to information. There's about five and a half billion people connected to the internet today. Uh, and also it brings us from a world of, scar world of scarcity and kind of uh, monopolization of resources to a world of, world of abundance, right? Where uh, things like storage and hardware and all kinds of technology that are cheaper than ever, where people can access them, where people have computers that are handheld, et cetera, et cetera. So that means a lot of change, right? Uh, there's a convergence between uh, exponential technologies that makes even more change happen. Um, scarce resources, as I, was, as I was saying before, become available globally and people can innovate every, anywhere. And... Um, you know, companies face new drivers, unsuspected competitors. Um, I think it was Ronald Coase, who's a, a known, well-known econo economist, who basically said that very large corporations and companies are needed because the transactional cost of doing what they do is too high otherwise, right? Meaning economies of scale are necessary, kind of large corporations are necessary. I wouldn't say they're not, but I think we can all say that there are industries and spaces where that may not be the case anymore. And those large corporations, as Matt was saying, that are very focused on their core, uh, can miss the forest for the trees, can miss what's going on around them and can easily get disrupted. And that is really the reason why status quo is not an option and why people should innovate, whether it be venture building or, or somewhere else, right? Now, what do they have going for them? Of course, resources, advantages, know-how, history, brands, uh, a number of things that they can leverage. And we believe, of course, because we are company builders or venture builders, that a well put together venture building strategy is probably a way to approach that for any type of corporation, right? So what do we think corporate venture builders do? Essentially, they allow uh, corporations to apply concepts of startup building and venture capital to foster innovation. Um, they allow them to capitalize on their own talent and entrepreneurship within a structure that allows it, allows creativity, right? And open innovation. Um, and of course, they allow them to take risks in a mitigated way uh, using a portfolio strategy, which is perhaps the most important thing if well done, right? Um, and obviously, clear, potentially create new businesses in a cost-effective way uh, and accelerate transformation, right? Uh, as I was saying before, uh, we see this as a kind of broader view, meaning for us, corporate venture building is not just venture studios. It can be new business building, which is essentially what, what we were saying before about venture studios and creating new startups internally, whether it be spin-offs or not. It's open innovation that to us includes partnerships with externals, being uh, startups with other corporates, and also things more like accelerator programs, right? And it includes corporate venture capital, which is essentially uh, funds or vehicles used to invest in technologies, used to invest in other companies, potentially acquire them later, et cetera. 
Obviously, in the corporate world, these things have a little bit of a different meaning than out there in the wild. Uh, and it's important to know that. Um, but essentially, if well done, uh, it really does increase the likelihood of innovation success. Uh, it allows you to use kind of well-known tactics for startups and cultural sort of differences for startups um, with the resources of your corporation, right? Uh, some of the things that it allows is essentially diversifying, looking at other growth channels, right? Um, uh, to well done, obviously, well executed, a strategic alignment with the core. Uh, and uh, again, as people were saying before, you know, I think it requires some alignment as well, some uh, sort of um, independence, but well done, it really does execute what it needs to execute, right? Of, of course, risk mitigation, meaning it's kind of a, a hard sell to just kind of get into startups without a real strategy and a real strategic alignment. But ultimately, if you have a good process, a good methodology and a good infrastructure around what, you, what venture building means, means specifically in your organization, then you're going to have a way to mitigate the risk while still being able to take it, right? Which the whole point here is to take risk is not to not take it, right? And, and again, managing innovation in a more efficient way in a way in which it's measured, sure, it's aligned, everybody understands why or why you're not doing it, and it doesn't become a burden, as Matt was saying before, right? Um, so we think there's some key sort of questions that, that anybody should ask before getting into this, right? Um, before all the drawbacks and everything else, I think there's some simple ones, and this is going back to the fact that we think there's a way to customize uh, the approach at every corporation, right? One is, uh, seems simple, but it's, it's kind of, when we ask it, it ends up being a very hard question. It's a sort of like, how much are you willing to invest here, right? Are you betting the house? Are you doing it just to look good? Is it a marketing budget, right? Are you really, truly looking to build new businesses for how long, which, what kind of time horizon, et cetera, et cetera, right? And all those, when they don't ask those questions, it's when things tend to get murky in our, in our experience, right? So, you know, are you willing to acquire the human capital required? Why would, do I say that? Obviously, there's specific talent that, that is needed to uh, bring forth a good corporate innovation strategy, a venture builder, and a startup, right? Um, there are many times companies that just can't acquire the talent or are not willing to do what it takes to acquire it, right? And it doesn't mean that they all can't have a venture strategy as broadly defined by the, what, what I just said earlier, but it does mean that perhaps... Uh, someone who doesn't want to do it may want to look more at open innovation and accelerators more than building internal ventures, right? Um, then short-term results are a big one, right? Like we encounter a lot of people who seek to innovate, seek to take risk, and then kind of measure themselves to really short-term, really bottom line, really core results. And that tends to also basically kill innovation because, uh, because you know, two years later, they find themselves just not being able to measure with the right tools and keep it KPIs and just kind of end up killing things that may, may, may have deserved to not be killed. Right. Um, so that the other one and tied to this one is, or, or are you looking at reinventing your business? Are you thinking long-term? Are you thinking as something that can be someone insulated from the day to day so you can actually get real, uh, traction, right? Um, do you have specific economic growth goals? Again, like, is this going to be tied to numbers, to immediate numbers, to core numbers, to non-core numbers, et cetera? Um, and obviously, are you looking to go beyond your core in a way that, you know, looks more at exponential technologies, perhaps leverages your assets, but it's not looking at just digital transformation internally or, you know, efficiency or whatever it might be. And I think all these questions, once answered, and there's many other questions, obviously, really help a company before they dive into this understand, you know, what is the recipe, uh, if there is one for corporate venturing or corporate venture building within the organization, right? Um, so for us, there's a few keys to implementing this. Yeah, almost done. Um, that include uh, that it's got to be whatever you pick. There has to be both autonomy and alignment, meaning there's got to be good governance. There's going to be, there has to be some freedom of budget and freedom of action, but at the same time, it has to absolutely be aligned with uh, core tenants and strategic insights that come from the corporation itself. Um, there has to be a process, right? Repeatable to some degree. Obviously, it can be more art than science, but there's got to be a way in which you say, 
hey, what do I deem to be product market fit? When should I invest more or less? When do I kill things? How do I measure them? How do I compare them against each other? Right? And that's super important because when you're doing a bunch of different uh, initiatives, that tends to be an issue as well. Uh, obviously, measurement, right? And we like to say here, I mean, measurement, of course, is KPIs mostly, but um, measurement changes with the status or the stage, right? At a very early stage, you may have a lot of very qualitative, very kind of market sizing uh, type of KPIs. Uh, but as the thing progresses, as you iterated, you're going to find more quantifiable and more specific in, uh, KPIs, right? And it's important to measure it with the right KPIs at the right moments so that you actually don't kill things that have um, a future and kill the right ones, right? Because you should expect to kill some. Um, and of course, beyond all of that, a lot of flexibility, right? So process is great, measurement is great, uh, alignment is great, but there has to be a flexibility of mind and a flexibility of action and, and a nimbleness that allows you to take those risks, that uh, allows you to be comfortable with some failure, and that allows you to understand that it's the process itself that might add, end up adding value to the corporation, not just a specific, um, uh, what do you call them, the specific initiatives that you are bringing forth, right? Um, and I think with that, that's a very quick sort of rundown on how we see it and would love to answer some questions. Yeah, Juan, thank you very much. Can you please uh, shortly share, like, what is your business model? If you can share some numbers, like, do you take equity? Do you charge corporations? How many startups have you launched with them? This would yeah. be interesting. And also, there is one question from uh, Ivan. Uh, so it's, uh, what is the number one deal, break deal breaker for corporates in starting a partnership? In starting a partner, okay. So let me start with uh with the first part. So business model has changed over time, similarly to others. Uh, on the corporate side specifically, uh, today we look more like a creative doc, as as he was describing earlier. So we essentially put fees at risk. We take an upside in um, around results, right? And the reasons are many, but they have to do with the fact that uh, we love to take upside, but equity is not always the best, particularly for very large corporations, right? They have issues even doling out equity. Oftentimes, they haven't even decided whether they're going to spin off or absorb. There's many reasons why that doesn't make a lot of sense, but they do want you to have some skin in the game and, and we're all about it, right? So we end up with corporates more often than not uh, structuring deals around results and around essentially bonuses or fees at risk, right? Um in some cases, we have shared equity, but those are kind of the minority, not the majority. And generally speaking, our venture studio on the other side, of course, we've we've uh, run uh, SPVs and specific investment vehicles, done capital investments. We've taken equity uh, as part of our co-founder share as well. We've done a number um, a number of different things. Uh huh. Yeah. And uh, uh, about the number one deal breaker when you partner with a corporation. For us or for them? I'm not... uh, for them. For them? Uh, you know, I think for them, at an early stage, when it doesn't kind of progress, it tends to be because they realize they don't have the appetite, right, to, to pursue that risk. So that tends to be a deal break. And then, of course, on the flip side of that, on the other end, you know, sometimes uh, things don't go as expected, right? And that's when you either have an actual venture building strategy, meaning you're ready for the next one, get back on the horse, or you say, hey, this is not for me, right? Like I'm not, not going to have more, more failures or, or have successes, right? And that's why it's so important at the corporate level to really be committed to the strategy and to the value of doing this, uh, regardless of specific uh, initiatives and looking at it from a portfolio perspective, from a cultural change perspective, from a kind of future-proofing perspective. That's the only way it stays alive, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. I'm really excited to introduce you to our next speaker. Uh, this is Masha. Masha is my colleague uh, from the Venture Studio family. She is our event and community manager. And I'm really excited to introduce her because she will be speaking at our uh, public event for the first time. So please give her a warm welcome. Uh, thank you, Annie. Hello, everyone. I'm so glad to participate in this uh, conference as a speaker this time, not at the backstage. As always, um, 
So uh, our team has already participated in our conference as the speakers and moderators. So uh, Max, Amy, Roman, Maxim did it already, but it's my first time. I'm also participating as a speaker in the, in the conference. So our uh, small team, uh, our family is connecting the venture studios worldwide. So it's uh, one of our mission. And uh, Max told you about our startup studio, his startup studio research he made and published uh, last year. And I'm uh, really excited to say that we have reached more than 50,000 readings of this uh, research. We also made uh, the translation of this research on five languages and preparing even more. Uh, for the half, uh, half a year, we made uh, six online conferences, including this one, and we published uh, more than 20 podcast episodes with uh, notable uh, founders of, of uh, different uh, studios uh, of, from all over the world. But uh, our main uh, project and one of the biggest project of our uh, of our team, it's the Venture Studio family. It's a P2P community for Venture Studios where they can share their insights, uh, best practices, uh, documents, but also ask for some questions and advice to their peers. And uh, one of our main activities inside the community is P2P Zoom calls. We are organizing uh, six calls per uh, quarter. Uh, the duration of these calls is one hour and a half so it's enough time to uh, uh, for 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 very fruitful discussions, and uh, each studio could be represented by uh, two members uh, participating in all activities of the family. Uh, we are also making two separate uh, uh, calls for different time zones, so the uh, studios from California to New Zealand uh, can participate in one of them uh, and discuss uh, their questions, the same topics, uh, with different peers. Uh, we also inviting the speakers to our closed calls. Uh, these are not only the founders of the notable uh, studios like Venture Rock, Mama Zen, Builders, The Heart, but also some um, experts in uh, different topics, for example, in uh, fundraising. So uh, the most discussing topics are attracting founders to, uh, to the studios and fundraising to Studio Air Fund. Uh, we also uh, have already considered um, the topics uh, of studio revenue streams, uh, cash flow, and the studio teams. But we are, uh, it doesn't mean that uh, we have discussed these uh, uh, topics already and we are not coming back to it. No, uh, some of our speakers are adding some values to these topics and they are uh, presenting their concepts, for example, about evergreen fund model or slicing pie for uh, equity split in the studio uh, or stock option plans uh, for the core team of the studio. Uh, we can also compare and and ask uh, what is the real second time founders. It's not a normal uh, second time founders, but real. Uh, some uh, some studios can present such a concept. And uh, is it okay to um, uh, to find the second time failed founders to attract them? Uh, we also uh, open to any difficult difficult questions coming from our members. For example, one studio asked how to break up with a founder who doesn't peel it off, pull it pull it off, and uh, how to break the contract with such founder. So it's a real story, and we are trying to find uh, a good answer to this uh, challenge altogether. Uh, or how to make deep tech uh, industry uh, studios sexy for investors? How to uh, to attract more investors for the for the deep tech uh, studios. Uh, we also try to look at different uh, topics and uh, problems and challenges from different angles. Uh, one studio uh, saying, for example, that they had negative experience of working with academia and university founders from universities. From, from another side, we are inviting the speaker who talk about his venture studio based in one university, in one uh, well-known university, and how they're using the facilities of the university and the staff at university for uh, making the new ventures and new companies. We also try to implement the customized approach, so we are open to different requests from the from our studios. Um, and uh, for example, we are organizing for them by their request the industry focused and regional meetings. Uh, we have already held uh, such um, meetings for the studios uh, focused in health tech, deep tech, climate tech, and the studios from Asia Pacific region. Um, 
all the studios uh, joining the community, if you are joining right now, uh, you will get the um, access to all previous um, meetings. Uh, each card uh, in our website uh, contains the video recording of the meeting and some uh, summary. Um, and we also provide the exclusive access for our members to all the materials from our conferences, including the bonuses and the recordings, and also to all materials from the uh, from our podcasts. Um, so what's next? Uh, our next plans for a few next months uh, in May and uh, April and May, we will have next uh, calls, online calls on idea generation and studio structures. And we are also planning uh, one uh, industry focused meeting, meeting for the fintech studios. But one of the biggest events uh, uh, within our community, it's Investor Day. Um, we know uh, that uh, one of the closest uh, resources for all the studios uh, is the uh, investors who understand well the, the venture studio model. And uh, we are trying to uh, invite uh, more investors, uh, VCs, family offices, LPs, uh, uh, angels and so on to our online conferences uh, to show them this uh, venture studio model and to show the profitability uh, of such uh, such model. After that, uh, we invite them to this uh, investor day where our studios can pitch uh, their studios to this investor. So uh, there will be relevant uh, investors who are understanding well the venture studio model and uh, who may be ready to invest uh, uh, money to, uh, to, to to the studios. Um, um, uh, soon. And uh, the next uh, investor day, uh, the next pitching session will be uh, next week on April 17th. And we also plan another pitch session for the European and Asia Pacific studios in May. So if you are joining right now, we will try to find a spot uh, uh, for, your t uh, for your studio as well, if you, you, if you would like to pitch to the investors. So uh, now, if you would like to join the Venture Studio family, Annie will share with you uh, the link, it, uh, link to the application form, or you can use all of this direct link and uh, QR code. So we prepared uh, a better offer, a juicy, uh, juicy membership plan uh, right now. So uh, if you had uh, already asked us about participation and joining the Venture Studio, uh, but haven't decided yet to join, uh, or, um, fill out this form once again and i will send you uh, more information um, a good offer how to join the venture studio family right now with a very good membership plan thank you masha thank you for presenting our venture studio family community you did it very well so uh right now i would like to move on and introduce you to our next speaker uh, our next speaker is bruno montes carpes uh, he's a brazilian global executive experienced in expanding businesses across the globe with 20 years of experience working for private equity and vc-backed companies economist with masters in corporate finance international business and corporate law he is the co-founder and managing director of united ventures which is the international arm of fc CJ uh, Corporate Venture Group. And Bruno will present on the topic of the Brazilian twist, the CVB model applied to emerging markets. And before Bruno starts, I would like to ask you to write in the comments, uh, guess uh, how many companies uh, United Ventures have across its impressive 49 portfolios. So guess the number in the chat and maybe Bruno will answer that question in his presentation. Hi, Bruno. Hi, Annie. Hi, Max. Hi, everybody. Thanks again. Thanks, Max. And especially thanks to Annie. She's been incredibly patient with me. Just for you to know, just to, me to reintroduce myself, I'm a Brazilian based in London, but uh, I, I, I traveled to Brazil two days ago. So you can, you can imagine how messy, how crazy my, my, my schedule is. I'm literally working in, in British time. So I'm literally working four hours behind. It, I mean, anyway, it's not for you to pity me, but it's just, uh, it's, it's been really a mess this, over this, this last couple of days. But I mean, let me, let me go, let me introduce you. So my background is a little bit different than yours. Uh, my background is actually, I've been working for the past 20 years for private equity and venture capital portfolio companies, meaning private equity and venture capital backed companies. 
Uh, usually, I mean, I work for Morgan, for Goldman Sachs, JG, JP Morgan, Axel, and more recently to General Atlantic, and once again, and and and, and again, uh, Goldman Sachs. And the reason I'm saying this is because for every single company that I work for, we had a very specific interim management approach. When I say interim management approach, I mean really, truly hands-on approach. Uh, it's the way that I believe and stuff. It's the way that we do things here at FCJ. Let me share my screen. So, uh, I mean, without further delay, so this is FCJ in a glass. When I say in a glass, it's, it's really a glass. So we currently have 61 entities of that. Uh, plus that, we have 49 portfolios, meaning 49 corporate venture portfolios. Within that, we have 282, and when I say 282, I mean as of last month, uh, portfolio companies, startups, scale-ups, both seed, co-invested with General Flag and Goldman Sachs also. Um, we, I double-checked this number, so currently we have 1,470 investors with us, uh, roughly 10 million B2C customers, 13,000 B2B clients, uh, this is this is really out of date. So we currently have 420 entrepreneurs working with us, and we have executed fully executed a couple of, I mean, something close to three dozens of transactions, secondary one, and three exits, full exits. But uh, as I said, I'm Brazilian, so we need to understand a little bit of the context. So some context first, because what I, what we do is really different than what you have presented already. I mean, until the, until this moment. So a lot of people got impressed when I show this chart, this 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 map, because I mean, this is familiar to my, to me. But as I live in London, I do people got really surprised. So Brazil is really massive. Brazil is a gigantic country. Brazil is the fourth largest country in the world, if you consider continuous lands. It's the fifth, if you add Alaska to the US, uh, I don't. But I mean, for those I mean, Europeans and, and Asians, I mean, it's, it's easy to understand. Think of India and multiply by two, two and two and a half times. This is the size of Brazil. I mean, Brazil, Brazil is, is, there's a friend of me, I mean, there's a friend of mine in, in, in England that says that he used to take a seven hour flight in, within Brazil, and he would still wake up speaking Portuguese. And that was crazy for him, but he's married to a Brazilian, so, so but, but it's fine. So, and of that, and this, it's really important to, to, to explain that, 65% is the Amazon original forest. This is key to everything that we have been doing, and this is possibly key to the rest of the world. But you can't understand Brazil if you don't understand about our people, and I'm any, I know that I, I am really late, so I'm going to speed up a little bit. So um, you, you need to understand that. You need to understand about our people. So Brazilians are an ex-Portuguese uh, colony. We only ditched the, when we only got rid of the Portuguese in 1889. Sorry if there's any Portuguese here. But we also were the last country to abolish. Sorry. sorry. Yeah, I know that you live there, Max, but... Uh, uh, we were unfortunately the last country to abolish slavery, and of course, you you can see that we became republic one year after that because we forced the Portuguese to do this. But what people don't know is we ex we uh, promoted massive waves of immigration to Brazil after that because we needed to colonize the country without Portuguese. So Brazil has today, the current currently today has the largest Japanese colony outside of Japan, the largest Lebanese colony outside of Lebanon, and of course, and we do speak uh, Portuguese with an Italian accent. It's it's weird for people, some people, but we kind of like it. Uh, but what you possibly don't know about Brazil is that Brazil is cutting edge technology when it comes to fintechs, when it comes to aerospace, when it comes to energy, when it comes to health sector when it comes to uh, uh, everything related to renewables. And just a couple of things for me to jump into the, to the presentation. So Brazil today has the best clean, I mean, the cleanest uh, electricity matrix in the world, 84% is renewable. Uh, and this, this is important because this is not new. We haven't changed. This is from the 70s. The same goes to our biofuel hybrid 
uh, uh, fuel consumption. So 95% of Brazil's car fleet, we have jets that runs, that flights with ethanol. And once again, this is from the 70s. And we're not doing things from the 70s because we envisioned a lot of stuff before, but because we didn't have oil, we didn't have gas, we didn't have money to buy gas, we didn't have access to it. Uh, today, because of that, Brazil is booming in terms of financial inclusion. So Brazil has, I mean, Brazil recently uh, implemented the fastest open innovation payment, instant payment instrument, uh, an instrument ever implemented in the world. You can Google it. You can Google everything that I'm saying. Uh, and of course, if you meet, you have to have met a Brazilian before you know that we are really uh, a social media person. We are the, the heaviest users of WhatsApp, any suffering because of that, because the only, re the only way that I, talk, that I talk to her is through WhatsApp. So um, I have to give you this context because at FCJ, we say that we, Brazil, we Brazilians and we in Brazil are a very unequal country. We are really young. Everything is new in Brazil. Once again, we have less than 150 years as a republic. So we have to build everything from the zero, from zero or from the Portuguese. Uh, and we, well, there, there's a phrase that we say in, in, in FCJ is that adversity leads to creativity. That is the key to FCJ, that, because this is the key to a Brazilian soul. So no, without further delay, what do we do? FCJ has a very unique uh, format of uh, corporate venture building or corporate venture builders. Basically, what we do is, in a nutshell, we implement open innovation strategy for big corporations. So basically, what we understood was, uh, in a country like Brazil, in a country as big as Brazil, with little, I mean, massive country, with little access to credit, um, and when I say little access to credit, I mean 11% or 12% interest rate. So you don't have venture capital for that. So you need to go to a corporation. So what we understood was, instead of having a venture studio, a pure venture studio, building things from zero, it would be better for us to partner with big companies, with big corporations, and help them do something that they're, they can't do, that they have zero clue to do, meaning uh, uh, developing, fostering innovation through startups. What is our format? What is our model? We basically create a, an independent entity. A, a, when I say independent entity, it's exactly as similar when, with the same legality and the same jurisdiction as a portfolio from a venture capital. So we assemble a portfolio within, I mean, not within, but for a big corporation. Mm -hmm. And this is really key because it's never within the corporation. Otherwise, we understand that this is going to become a company's department. And that's exactly what we don't do. Um, in order for this portfolio to be independent, we run the portfolio. We assemble the portfolio. We identify the thesis. We identify the strategy. We define it, of course, with the corporation that holds a, a very big stake at it. But in order for that to be really, really independent in terms of governance, we we get investors to join. That's why we have over a thousand investors because for every single portfolio that we assemble, we raise cash and we raise cash with, with external investors. I was going to say that it's, that's obligatory, but it's not. But uh, we have, actually we have something that we say that the corporation can't have the majority stake in terms of money. Otherwise it's going to become a company's department again. And, if it becomes a company's department, no offense to any corporation, to any big corporation, but that uh, we have been seeing that this leads to, I mean, to, to lack successful strategies. So let me try to show you a few results. Uh, so, our, I mean, just, just uh, I mean, to jump into the results, we have three growth vectors. So we assemble the portfolio and the portfolio is growing and the portfolio is growing in terms of value. Um, we keep adding startups to the portfolio and developing them from an, I mean, from a post ideation pre MVP stage. And of course, we're adding portfolios to it. So in the past 10 years, this is our results. 
So uh, we've been doing this for precisely 11 years, almost 11 years. We, in the first four to five years, we were sharpening our model. Since the seven, six last years, latest years, we started to boom because we sharpened. I mean, we, did, we, we finally understood what was the model. Today, every time that we add a portfolio, we expect that each portfolio will have in four to five years, 25 fully grown uh, foster startups there. When we say active startups, it's because, of course, you know that we're not talking about ideas and, of course, and startups that have failed. We're talking about active startups that are with, um, with current revenue, work clients. This is, this is key. This is our group. This is just a quick picture of our group. Every single icon here is a different, is a different CVB, is a different portfolio. And let me jump into the other, to, to the late, to the last one. So, and this is a sample. This is a portion of our group. Every single icon that I've shown in the previous slide, I can show you, I can send you this, guys. Uh, I can send you late the, the, this presentation. But every single icon is a portfolio. Every portfolio has a different vertical. So currently we have seven portfolios for health, six for agro, three for, for, uh, for deep tech, we have AI, we have women tech, we have pet tech, we have everything, whatever tech, because it depends, it comes from our corporations. So once again, remember that we have outsourced that for them. So it's not only our vertical, because we believe that that, that could be a great vertical, but it's also because it is sponsored by a corporation, then that, of course, eventually will be the potential exit. To the, to, the, to the startup. So uh, that's it. Sorry. Uh, so what does it mean that you collect a portfolio? So you uh, you go to a corporation or they a corporation goes to you and you ask them, uh, so you say, we'll find the right startups on the market and you will invest in those startups uh, or you will buy those startups. Like what, uh, how... Does so, work. Okay, so yeah, so that, that was an evolution of the process. So at the very beginning, we were a venture studio and we understood that the potential for success from that it would take 10 to 15 years, or we would need tons of cash. So that was the moment that we addressed and talked, started to talk with corporations for them to sponsor that because we knew, we all know, that corporations are slow. Uh, in terms of innovation, because that's actually what they are aimed to. They, they are really solid uh, companies, and that's, I mean, they need to avoid risks. So uh, we start at the very first, at the very first model, the very first uh, um, format that we had, we were, we were a corporate venture studio addressing corporation needs. So the first step was uh, we, would, uh, we would screen and map the corporation gaps in order to understand what we could do to fulfill those, those gaps. Later, what we decided was that would still take a lot of time. So instead of doing that, and once again, rethink, rethink, I mean, reconsider the size of so yourself, why we would, we would do, why we would try to do everything from zero if we have a country of this size with so many opportunities and so many startups trying to, I mean, struggling to, to, to develop themselves. So what we do is instead, I mean, what we did was instead of building everything from zero, from, from the ground, we implemented what we call the open innovation venture builder. So basically we don't do things from zero. We do things post ideation, pre MVP, when the company has already understood, I mean, the company, I mean, the corporation, I've already understood that mm, I need something with that kind, similar to that, or on that direction. And um, so, of course, it's worth trying. It's worth trying. I mean, there'll be cash for it. And there will be plenty of room for um, you to... Do you buy, do you buy companies or do you invest uh, from, from corporations into those new startups? You, you said buy or? Buy or invest? Both. Uh -huh. Both. 
But uh, and recent... valuations are usually like until several million or even less, right? Yeah, less. it's it's usually when we buy, it's really it's really rare for us to buy something because it means that there's really an opportunity. Because what we have understood is instead of buying, it's usually better to partner with that and investing on that and, in, in, and adding it to the portfolio. Usually, I'm, I'm going to say that I can't say that we have done uh, 100% of organic, but it was surely 95% of that. Uh -huh. uh, can we call your model like an outsource of uh, corporate venture capital? I would say that you're right. You're right. It's, it's not only a because there is the corporate venture capital format right but uh if the corporation is not mature enough and that's what we understood in the, in the i mean during the past 10 years usually the corporations are not ready or are not mature to have a separate entity and in order for that separate entity to be run to be uh, managed completely with a different mindset. The thing is about the mindset. My, big corporations have a mindset because they have to protect their assets and, of course, avoid risks. Uh, corporate venture capital or venture capital or startups, that's, the, that's exactly the opposite. You need to embrace risks and try to mitigate them. Otherwise, you're not going to evolve. You're not going to develop anything. So what we do is, okay, you need to cross this side, corporate venture, I mean, with a big corporation that doesn't know how to do it, but still want to do something uh, with this side that absolutely has no access to this side. So it's, I would say that it is outsourcing corporate venture capital strategies, um, or better saying, really early corporate venture capital strategies. Uh, yeah, and very uh, short un uh, question, and I, I expect a very short answer. When you earn money, so what is your business model? Do you take some just fees from corporations, or you have some equity in those companies that corporations invest? We, it's simple. We do both. We do both. We transfer tech. When we when we assemble something for the for the corporation, of course we get paid for that. We got a fee and a very generous fee because we're transferring uh, intellectual property and of course we're transferring knowledge to the company. We teach them, we coach them how to do it. But for every single thing that we do, we got equity on that. We don't do any. We're not advisors. So for every single company that I showed you, we have a significant portion of equity. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Super. Super. Bruno, thank you very much. Very interesting model. Uh, and thank you. very bright presentation. So it's. Yeah. I, 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 I told you it was long. So sorry once again. But thank you. Thank you, Max, for the opportunity. And Annie, thank you. And I'm really excited to introduce you now to Dr. Melissa Sassi. This is venture partner at Machine Lab, uh, Machine Lab Ventures. Uh, Machine Lab Ventures enables startups and scale-ups to accelerate growth and brings tech innovation to enterprises ac across the globe. And Melissa herself has scouted and developed 20, 250 plus tech founders in 80 plus countries, resulting in $500 million plus capital raised and $2.7 billion in company valuations. So Melissa has a very catching topic, which is called Venture Building is Broken. And I'm really excited to hear what you have to say about it. Hi, Melissa. Thank you for stepping in earlier. Yeah, no worries. Um, all right. So if my connection seems a little wonky, I can uh, I can leave where I am right now. I built a, uh, a little office uh, that I call my man cave, even though I'm not a man. Um, I have my, my man cave office. So um, sometimes connection gets a little wonky. So just tell me. Um, oh. Yeah, so I'm going to first off maybe just do, um, you know, kind of a, a couple of things of how, how I fit into the world. So I think, um, you know, Annie kindly, kindly um, shared, oh, I know it's supposed to be a women cave, but I kind of find it funny to call it a man cave. I don't know why, but I'm just responding to the comments in the, in the chat. But, um, you know, I, I, I spent um, five years at Microsoft and I spent four years at IBM. Um, did a stint um, at BlackRock and um, at uh, Goldman and, you know, worked with like the 10,000 women campaign and some of these different things. And um, 
you know, really uh, judged a lot of startup competitions, a lot of hackathons, you know, work on a number of different, you know, kind of uh, UN things where I, I speak like all of us with um, entrepreneurs, you know, budding and seasoned um, from all over the world. And, you know, I think there's this common thread, you know, we all know that, um, you know, X percent, whether it's 80 or 90 or whatever the number is now of, you know, startups fail. And, I think even if you look at, you know, um, venture, you know, you know what venture, you know, how uh, uh, capital is going to, you know, women or underserved communities or just regular old people, um, you know, it's a, a dismal state of affairs, right? And, you know, I think in many parts of my career, I look back and I'm like, ooh, you know, maybe I was part of the problem, you know, and I think that's how things go. And, you know, I used to do this presentation um, and I'm going to open something up in a second, but... Um, and I thought like, oh my gosh, I have the answer, you know, like, um, you know, this whole venture studio thing, like I'm onto something, you know, um, we've got this tech piece, we've got these mentors and we're bringing all these pieces together through, you know, corporate partnerships and, you know, getting access to tech and access to, um, you know, customers, you know, speeding up revenue, helping, you know, founders hold on to their, um, their capital or their, their equity. And... <laughs> This week, a few weeks ago, I, I met I met this guy, you know, amazing founder. And, um, you know, he was part of the original team at Amazon who built AWS. And, you know, he's a you know, friend of a friend. And I've heard about him, you know, from the you know, distance. And I kept hearing about this thing he was building. And this thing that he kept on building and his apps and whatever, his super apps and applicable everywhere. And I realized that, man, I was broken too. And how I was building ventures, even though I said venture building was broken, you know, I hadn't necessarily figured it out. And, um, you know, so I started to kind of talk about this a little bit um, because I think, um, you know, there, as venture builders, I think a lot of us um, think like, okay, all right, I've, I've touched 250 companies. It's like $2.7 billion in valuation. By the way, I'm not a billionaire. Um, that's a problem too. But, um, you know, I think, I, I you know, I looked and said, like, okay, I know what I'm doing. Like, wow, you know, I, I've worked with these amazing, you know, people and I've been able to help people get, you know, get access to a lot of money. And yeah, so let me show you um, why I think venture building is broken. And let me show you um, an answer. All right. So let me just share my screen. And it's super simple. I, I like, um, you know, sexy slides, but today I decided, I decided to go low rent and um, make this kind of simple. So, and, you know, like I said, I just redrafted this whole thing. I had this beautiful presentation. And then two weeks ago, I'm like, man, I'm scrapping this whole thing. I'm doing this different. And here's what I've got. You know, so if you think about how things work, and not everything works in this linear fashion. So this is like an oversimplification of how things work. But, you know, um, you got a guy, you got a girl, you got a, you know, you got, you know, they, who, whatever, you know, kind of coming together and saying, we should build something. I see a problem. I see an opportunity. You know, I have an idea, you know, whether that's one person, two people, whatever. And, you know, that next step for that person or those people, you know, it may be, let me go build. Let me go talk to people. Who do I know? You know, it's usually kind of your side shimmy for many of us. You know, some people look at it and say, all right, great. Awesome. Let's go define our requirements. You know, what do we want to build? And let's go code. Let's start it. But then you these other people, many of us, who are like, wow, I wish I had money. You know, I've got this other job and I have this great idea, great experience. I don't have any money um, or I don't have a network. I don't know how to pitch or, man, I wish I could code. You know, I don't know how to do any of that. You know, so I get through this and, you know, regardless of whether know how to code, don't know how to code, I'm assuming a tech company, guys, I work in tech, so forgive me. Um, but, you know, they get to this point of saying, okay, I need money, I need funding. You know, I can't, you know, whether you come from whatever you come from, you know, there's this point where you've got to have, you got to have funding to do what you're doing, right? I need customers. And wait a second, you know, this, do, do people really want what, what I'm offering? Shoot, did I even talk to anyone as I was building this thing? Did I talk to the right people? Shoot, did I, did I do enough? Ask the right questions? Who knows? And, you know, venture building, whether you're a founder, whether it doesn't matter where you are, it's lonely. It's, it's lonely thinking like, okay, I'm risking it all because many of us do. And I say that from experience because I have and like, oh my gosh, I'm a failed founder. What should I do now? Let's pivot. You kind of look around and be like, okay, how much do I share? 
You know, like, what do I, how much, how much do I tell people like, man, I've been fundraising for a year and I haven't landed on anything or things are going really great. I have these great meetings, you know, you hear a lot of this, right? Like who can, you know, who do you trust? Who's in the circle? Obviously not all of us, you know, have that, have that challenge. Some of us, you know, um, have a napkin. This is not me, by the way, I have a napkin and they throw out this idea and then a hundred million dollars falls out of the sky. You know, some then kind of look and say, wait a second, you know, this is definitely lonely. Maybe I, you know, maybe I didn't, you know, um, talk to the right people. Maybe I'm not getting customers. Maybe nobody wants to fund me. Maybe I got a bad idea or maybe it just needs to be tweaked, whatever. You know what? I'm going to quit. I'm going to go back to, I'm going to go back to, you know, working for whomever. I'm going to switch ideas. Doesn't matter. You know, I'm done. You know, some who are like, you know, still with us now, like, okay, all right, I'm doing this. Right. And they land on money. Okay. Awesome. I've got money now. Okay. Now I gotta like hire people. Do I really want to, do I really want to like have this massive growth? Some may be good at it. Some maybe not. Who knows? Um, now I gotta build that thing because maybe I had a little thing and maybe it was my proof of concept. Well, how long is that going to take for me to build that thing? Wait a second. Again, did I ever go out and did I talk to my prospects? Did I talk to, you know, that target audience? Did I really spend enough time, you know, um, figuring out if people want my thing? People are willing to pay for my thing. And, you know, is my thing really answering, you know, um, what it needs to answer? Most of the time when I look at, um, you know, how founders are doing things, especially, you know, early stage and those that have just a lot of promise, you know, really great ideas. But maybe again, going back here, no money, no network, can't code, don't know any techies, can't pay any techies. You know, they're, they're, they've stopped. They've got lived experience, amazing lived experience, but they're, you know, they're not, they're not able to go on. Even those who get money, I don't know how many of you have seen, um, you know, how many companies will actually get money and then realize, wait a second, I don't know what the heck I'm doing. <laughs> And, you know, it's taken me, you know, 40 to 50% longer, maybe two times as long. And maybe I haven't made, you know, effective use of that, that money. So there's another way. Like I said, I, I kind of stumbled upon it by accident, but kind of on purpose. It was kind of like almost um, stumbling in, in, you know, in my lap when I needed to. This is uh, one of the companies that I work with. And you'll probably notice I've got two, two companies down here. Um, so I'm actually... I, I have two venture studios. Long story, there's purpose. I promise I'm not going to get into, you know, the whole um, rationale why, but this is kind of my, more of my fintech arm and, you know, where I build, you know, kind of fintech and more kind of global things. This is where I kind of focus on small business and, um, you know, social, social impact stuff. Promise it makes sense for me. Um, and I promise it does others if we, you know, spend more time, but that's not the purpose of today. As I mentioned, um, you know, a friend of mine, um, was an early, you know, developer at um, at Amazon. You know, Jeff was his boss. He met Rob, and Rob was one of the founders of AWS. Who spent a significant amount of his last whatever, you know, building this um, solution that I call instead of um, going out and building your e-commerce solution, your community, your whatever. It's like this amazing super app. And I'm all about it right now. It kind of, um, for lack of better words, helps founders to say, you know what, why do I need to build this tech solution? And I know that sounds crazy. Like, wait a second, how is there going to be like one super app that can snap into all of these different use cases? But I'm all about it right now. I'm going to just um, go to their website so you can see. And, you know, it's funny, Rob and I were talking the other day. And if you Google, um, you know, Rob, Robert Frederick, you'll find, um, you know, early old school videos of him and Bezos, um, you know, presenting at MIT. And it's really cool, like blast from the past, nostalgic kind of stuff. But, you know, the five major, you know, kind of if you think about the five major kind of revenue things at AWS, those are things that, you know, Rob was part of and Rob invented uh, with the team. And um, you can find a little bit about, um, you know, kind of the company that I'm all about that I think um, will democratize access to um, tech for, for founders. And I know when you look at this, at first when I looked at his website, I'm like, Rob, that's not what shouts out here, bro. You know, when I look here, you know, you're talking to a technical person. When I look here, I think, okay, play field, mesh technology, what the hell does that have to do with a community? What the hell does that have to do with an e-commerce platform? Don't worry, I'm working on that. So um, it's really, I kind of see it as engagement as a service.
you know, how do you snap in an app? How do you snap in a platform without building it yourself initially? It's not to say you're never going to migrate to it, but is it the answer for everything? Who knows? You know, I think I'm tired of seeing founders with great ideas who crash and burn because they don't have any money. They don't know how to code. They waste their money. Don't talk to the right people and don't take an opportunity to say, what can I use right now? And why do I have to build something instead of, you know, as my MVP? So hopefully venture building will not be, you know, broken for much longer, but this is one answer that um, I see as promising. Melissa, do you think that companies can be launched without this building an MVP? So meaning that you can test some ideas just by uh, talking to your customers and selling? Well, I think it depends. It, you know, it depends. I mean, I think that there's some things where you can go out and have a chat and you don't even, you know, it's like low tech. You don't really need all the bells and whistles of things. I think it, um, again, it depends upon what you're, what you're trying to, what you're trying to solve. You know, if you're trying to do something, you know, with like financial services and fintech and all that stuff. Yeah, no, you know, there may be some things you could talk about, but you know, you, you got to have something real, but, um, you know, I think it's kind of industry specific and use case specific, but, You know, I've been in situations where I've launched businesses with nothing, you know, like, okay, all right, we're going to, we're going to hodgepodge this stuff together. There is a big trend of like no code solutions or some platforms to launch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Faster. And uh, am I right that you, you are presenting one of the... This one. Uh, yeah. yeah. So because like I get uh, many messages from many uh, development agencies like, We oh, this is like to totally different. I swear. I know it's like, you're like, wait a second, whatever. It's, you know, and by the way, I'm not like, I'm not, I don't have equity in the company, but I hope to. Um, I'm just all about what they're doing right now. But no, I'm a big fan of like, even, you know, kind of, if I think about um, this is kind of a simple thing, but if I think about going into like small businesses or community banks or regional banks, it's just kind of a US focused comment right now. But you know, kind of coming in with really simple stuff, like using like Microsoft Power Apps and stuff like that, like Microsoft Power. There's just so many really cool things that you can do um, without having, you know, to build this crazy thing that's yours and has your, you know, your stamp and your footprint on it. You know, it, it sounds great until you're two can years, be, you're uh, two years on, call, you know. Yeah. Can we call such uh, platforms like a no-code platform or not? Or there is some difference? Because many development agencies, they, they develop their own way on how to launch MVPs 10 times faster. I guess I'm saying um, I don't want, I, I don't need a development agency, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, in some ways, you know, this is kind of that, but, you know, I think in, in you know, I don't want, I want someone who understands my market. And, and I'm not, and I think that is also kind of one thing that somebody, you know, folks have to consider when, you um, you know, building something, you know, it's so often that, you know, kind of you look at your financials, look at what you can do and your first choice is, all right, all right, my, my, I have a limited amount of budget, where do I go? And all of a sudden, you know, you've got, you know, something that might be built by, you know, folks who may not have ever been to your country or understand like your, um, your consumers, your, your target audience, you know, that sort of thing. And it's so easy to just miss stuff as you're going along and have decisions be made um, that have, um, you know, big impacts, but you just don't realize it at the time, you know? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you. Uh, I'll put some uh, info in the, in the chat and, you know, feel free anyone to reach out. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, really catching presentation. Thank you for your practical advice. You already have a couple of fans in the chat. <laughs> you can check out um, the message. Yeah. I don't know if it's like a hot take or not, but all right. Good. Thank you. Uh, now uh, uh, let's move on. And I told you before that we have a heartfelt activity today, which is postcard exchange. I'm already prepared, but I will give a word to my colleague Masha that you've all seen today before to tell uh, tell you more about this idea. Uh, yeah, thank you, Annie. Yes, I'm uh, the fan of traveling and even my dog, Max Turis, he's traveling with me sometimes. He was in Istanbul, for example. And one of my tradition uh, during the travelings, I'm sending myself uh, to my home address, to my family, so the postcards from different parts of the world. Just a few examples. So one postcard from my beloved Paris, another one from uh, uh, Lisbon. Hello to Max. Another one from Iceland. And another island, it's Boracay Island from Philippines. And another part of the world is the uh, Patagonia in Argentina and uh, Chile. And many, many 
other postcards. So my suggestion to you uh, to make uh, to bring our uh, network into the next level and uh, to send each other the postcards from different parts of parts of the world. So uh, any I see sharing with you uh, the link to okay uh, once again another one form yes it's a Google form but the, this one is more uh, more funny more interesting so you can go to the uh, to this uh, form fill out your uh, post address. Um, information and we will do the match uh, randomly uh, between the people from different parts of the world so you uh, we will inform you to whom you need to send uh, one postcard from your place and you will get uh, uh, another postcard from another part of the world so i will definitely participate also in this <laughs> in this uh, adventure and this activity uh, and so if you are interested to participate and would like to send one postcard to, to get another one please fill out this form and we will organize it for you. Uh, we will not uh, share it publicly. Your address is only to the person who will send you uh, the postcard. Yes, of course. Thank you, Masha. I'm also really excited to participate in this activity, and this is a great idea. I've never done it before, but I'm already prepared. I went to the shop today, and I'm really going to do it in my next travels. That's amazing. So we have two more amazing speakers today, and now I would like to introduce you to Christian Heifenhain, a visionary in corporate startup readiness, who has dedicated over 15 years to bridging the innovation gap between large corporations and startups. Christian's journey includes founding startups with his third venture successfully sold in 2022, and he's recognized as a leading specialist in venture clienting, and he now empowers corporates to enhance their startup engagement strategies. And Christian will tell us today about the corporate startup readiness. Hi, Christian. Hi. Thank you for the opportunity. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Yes. Perfect. Thanks for the opportunity. Who of you guys knows the term venture clienting? By, by show of hands or, or just type into the chat, I. How familiar are you guys with the term venture clienting? The innovation game for large corporates has changed dramatically over the last 15 years from my perspective. It has changed dramatically. The, the innovation game has changed dramatically, and I see a certain shift for European corporates to venture clienting. And why is that? So there, there are uh, about uh, 100 uh, large corporates who are doing venture clienting. Some of them have even dedicated a, or have established a dedicated venture client unit to do venture clienting internally. And why is that? So I, I see three reasons for this shift within corporate uh, innovation and corporate venturing to venture clienting. The first one is um, technology change. Very easy. We don't need to go into that too, you, too deep. You know all that. The technology change is dramatically. We now we have ChatGPT and all the corporates are struggling with the technology change. Number two, the changes in the working world. We see a lot of changes in the working world. Corona pushed that. You also know that. I don't need to go into this too deep. Um, the, the changes in the working world are also enforcing this push to new forms of innovation. And number three, the macroeconomic drivers. We are now coming out of the decade of cheap money. Interest rates have been low. Money has been cheap. And capital was moving to riskier assets. And startups, as one form of risky assets, have been flooded with money. The first quarter 2024 of the VC investment volumes, the dark blue columns here, uh, the first quarter 2021 have been bigger than the whole year 2017 of the VC investment volumes. The venture capital volume was, was flooding the markets. Uh, in light blue columns, you see the R&D budgets of the corporates. They have been basically stable. And this decade now is over. Since two, two and a half, three years, we see rising interest rates. And with this shift, we see, uh, uh, with this interest rates and with cut budgets, we see shifts to, um, from focus to, uh, to growth and top line to efficiency and bottom line. I know so many investment managers, corporate investment managers who have their board saying, Hey, could you double innovation activities with half the budget? So this is the shift I see to venture clienting. Since 2018, 2019, the venture clienting model is, is quite established, especially in Europeans, uh, European corporates. I see a difference to the, to the United States and America. 
you have so um, many large pension funds, you have so much uh, liquidity in the market that the model is different. In Europe, it's uh, it's there's a, um, a more efficiency pressure on the corporates. But those three shifts, the, the technology change and the, the change in the working world and uh, the, the, the cheap money having strong effects on large corporates. And I basically see, uh, I saw three when I was working for Bosch, 15 years for Bosch, uh, Bosch Ventures also, also in consulting. First effect was, um, the, um, the large corporates had to review their image of startups. When I talked to a plant manager a couple of years ago and asked them, hey, what is a startup? Um, this plant manager of Bosch said, that's a 20-year-old academic uh, IT student who likes to code and has a business idea now. That's not my image of a top startup. Uh, large corporates had to review their image of top startups. Top startups are massively funded. They're sometimes even more funded than the corporate innovation departments. That's number uh, fact number one. Effect number two, large corporates had to review their R&D spendings. I give you an example of Bosch. Bosch has a, a 7 billion in R&D and every single year. That's a lot of money. Still, that's peanuts against the global tech venture capital. capital. And large corporates, they can make use of uh, global tech venture capital and leverage their own uh, uh, R&D activities because they don't need to raise that money to make use of those solutions. They can partner with those startups, right? So effect number two on, on large corporates was they had to review their image of, um, uh, of startups and they had to review their internal R&D spendings. And number three is large corporates had to become an easy partner for startups, an easy client for startups. Um, when Bosch 2017, 2018 wanted to meet a startup, they rented a minibus and drove 16 engineers and five lawyers to the startup CEO to assess risks, right? So not, not a very lean and easy way to, uh, to get into the, um, to the partnership. What is an easy client? What is an easy partner for a large corporate? Uh, and a person who exactly understands the pain point who has the evaluation competence to identify a better solution and who has the commitment to solve it. Commitment in corporate terms means budget and capacity. And then who acts fast, decisive and fast. And fast for me is an NDA in two hours or an ordering overnight. That is the speed I'm talking about. So the, the, the corporate um, venturing, the corporate innovation uh, model has changed for me in the last uh, 10, 15 years, uh, dramatically also through the um, technology change, through the uh, cheap money and through the changes of the working world. And I see the corporate venture capital model being uh, more and more involving. I give you an example of Bosch. Because I was working for Bosch 15 years, I was a part of Bosch Ventures. Bosch Ventures has the venture capital arm as the push. Those investors see the great startups and they are pushing them to the um, uh, to the corporate business units, but they are not taking over the pool. They are not running through the Bosch Group and identifying the demands. They are only seeing the trends and the great startups out there. And this push is important, but if you have only the push, it will not lead to implementation. If you look at the large corporates, the overlap, or if we look at Bosch, the overlap between portfolio invested, portfolio implemented before we established venture clienting and open Bosch was was a few percent, not really relevant. So that's why we uh, established Open Bosch, the venture client unit of the Bosch Group, who is the, the organizer of the pull, running through the Bosch Group, identifying the demands, um, and, and, and really pulling startup solutions, demand specifically, dedicated to this pain point, to this pain point owner, and uh, uh, doing pilots and, and implementing solutions that, uh, that work. So the, the venture clienting model is basically, uh, I think, uh, established. There is there are uh, five phases: discover uh, the demands, assess the solutions, contract the startup. So the philosophy is: if you want to use an iPhone to become more innovative, why do you buy Apple stock? Buy an iPhone, right? To have really a, a lean contracting phase with the startup to get into the pilot and then adopting what works. So if you if you're interested in uh, in the Q&A, I can dive into this operating model. There's a very dedicated operating model within the established venture client units in Europe that have a clear vision for what is the organization looking like, roles and responsibilities, what are the, the softwares you use to, to screen and scout startups, to interview pain point owners, what is the infrastructure you need, how do you do communication 
what are enabling processes, the alignments with legal purchasing IT, because for large corporate, I think this is really uh, important, legal purchasing IT, for large corporate, mostly the problem is never to find and filter startups. The large corporates are great at that. Also, the VCs are great at that. The biggest problem is to identify the demands of strategic relevance and to ensure the commitment to get an implementation done. That is the, that is the challenge and the venture clienting model is offering a solution for that. So uh, KPIs, we can talk about that. Yeah. What are your questions? My question is- Yes, uh, Max. Imagine that like, if I understand right, corporations have different uh, targets when they decide to uh, invest in new startups uh, or when they decide to build new startups uh, using the corporate venture building model. And when they just buy some some solutions for the company. So if I understand right, that when a company goes to invest in other startups and when they uh, build new companies, they pursue uh, new markets and new opportunities so that like it's completely something different from what they are doing. But when they are uh, going into the corporate, uh, how is it called, uh, venture client model, they want to grow their business and the main target is to become monopoly, to reach more markets and to be more efficient because they're using some new technologies. So and like uh, in my from my perspective, the targets are a bit different. So like one corporation can be at the same time uh, having a corporate venture uh, clienting model using this model and also building or investing in completely different startups on adjacent or even like more than adjacent market markets. Yes. So what you're talking about is the toolbox of corporate venturing. I fully agree with you. So there are many corporate venturing tools and, uh, and a large corporate like Bosch has many of them. M&A, venture capital, venture clienting, venture building, incubation, acceleration, hackathons, co-working, shared services, trend scouting, landscaping, entrepreneurship, oh, spin-offs, <laughs> you know, even more, right? And all of those tools, they have a certain purpose. And with this purpose comes advantage and disadvantage. And I have met a lot of corporates who are not really good at identifying the right tool for the right use case, right? So I have met corporates who say, we want to become more innovative. That's why we do venture capital. What? No, venture capital is a profitable business, uh, especially if you have the budget to uh, to manage this risk and portfolio play. So you do 100 deals, uh, 80 are crap, 18 are okay, and two are ho paying the whole fund, right? Then it's uh, profitable. Or um, uh, I, I met corporates who say, we, we want to develop products. That's why we do hackathons. What? No, hackathons are a recruiting tool. You need talent over there. If you want to develop products, that is rooted in the business unit, don't do hackathons. So I think there are many tools. And as you said, the venture clienting tool is um, paying to the original uh, task and mission of a corporate serving their customers. This can be in product innovation, developing new products or services. This can be in process innovation, uh, becoming better, faster, quicker, leaner, cheaper. Uh, this can be in business model innovation, whatever. Now that we have rising interest rates still, that we have cut budgets and a, and a weak economy, I see the shift from, from the expensive venture tools like M&A, venture capital, venture building, to more uh, lean uh, setups like, like venture clienting um, to, to complete the mission of the corporate becoming more innovative, not acquiring startups or not... Um, um, uh, buying the 10 billion new uh, product for yours, for your portfolio. You're right. So it's a very lean, uh, very lean, narrow focus on becoming more innovative. But when we talk about corporate venturing, I sense that, that this is, that this is totally underestimated and that some of the corporates, uh, when they're playing the investor or the builder, that they are quite weak in the setup and that they need professional support. That's my experience. Am I right that the difference between just a like supply and department of a corporate and venture clienting is that venture clienting is uh, looking for new solutions, maybe like a supply department will will miss? Or what is the difference? Yes. Yes. So I think uh, the purchasing department does not have the experience to deal with startups, does not have the budgets. So for look at Bosch. Um, the venture clienting units do, does pilot uh, with a budget below 100K. 
per pilot. Mostly the purchasing departments are not interested in dealing with this high risk, low budget or low volume suppliers. Right. So venture clienting, you can say if you if you really look only as, at the transactional perspective on the pilots and, and kick out the transformational pilots, you could say it's it's just an innovation purchasing department specialized on startups. Yes, it maybe is, but it has also transformational effect. And it's uh, it's even, I would say, a way to minimally invasive transform large corporates by doing a lot of startup uh, interaction, right? Mostly corporates are, are trying to change the world with one pilot. But if they manage venture clienting and if they do uh, hundreds or thousands of pilots per year, they can minimally invasively transform their corporate over here and over here and over here and over here. And I think this is underestimated still with most of the corporates. Super, Christian, thank you very much. You can also answer some questions in the chat. And uh, I think it will be super if you can prepare. So I, I loved your examples of like uh, hackathons is for hiring uh, and uh, uh, corporate venture capital is for profits. Uh, so, and you, you created the big list. So you mentioned big list of those different tools. Yes. You can create a like, list target Capital, so like something like a table we can share later with with all the participants. I will uh, I will share this one. This is probably the shortest. I have a longer one. Uh, yeah. Super but super. Uh, uh, if you you guys can do a screenshot here, or I, I'm going to put it into the slides afterwards. Thank you Thank so you much. Very much. And Max, uh, so now I'm finally excited to introduce you to Natalie Lamborghini Dumas. Uh, Natalie is the founder and CEO of Flying Reno, uh, the first venture studio to specialize in trusted platforms with a significant impact on society and the environment. With her 25-year journey in pioneering and executing disruptive strategies, products, and uh, partnership with blue chip companies, Natalie actively shapes up the ecosystem as a business angel mentor and coach and today Natalie will share insights into Flying Reno's unique approach to partnership highlighting collaborations with other studios across Europe. So please Natalie. Thank you Annie. So I just have to, uh, to give a big, big warning. Seems that my bandwidth came back but um, I haven't shared the, the presentation yet so uh, yeah, I'm just going to give it a try and see how it goes, right? Hope. Uh, if, yeah, and if, if you see, and uh, no, I don't realize that you don't hear me, uh, just cut me off and I can come back for another conference. Uh, I, I uh, apologize in advance. Well, uh, let me do it without slides and, uh, you know. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to talk about partnerships. So um, first of all, just a quick introduction. I'm, uh, uh, I've been working for quite a few years, I don't dare say the number, uh, for big uh, American uh, blue chip companies in innovation and uh, strategic partnerships, always at international level. I'm a graduate uh, from uh, Stanford and I've been uh, uh, advising a lot of uh, startups in different um, incubators across the world. Uh, uh, the Lisa Incubator in Stanford, Marseille Innovation in Marseille, Hupos in Finland, one in Tunisia. So I'm, I've got um, uh, all of this uh, in my DNA of working, this uh, uh, international and collaboration work. So what do we do at Flying Rhino? We are um, an innovation and corporate venture studio, which is uh, specialized in impact platforms and ecosystem companies. We're, we're talking about uh, platform business models and ecosystem business models. So we've got two, uh, uh, um, two arms. One is the advisory part uh, where we support companies uh, at every stage of their uh, innovation on platforms from ideation to implementation. So here we will be more of a facilitator or a, a kind of driving force. And uh, we've got the corporate venturing uh, activity, which is uh, so helping corporates building new businesses. So we create for and with uh, corporates uh, their new platform or ecosystem businesses, of course, in line with uh, innovation and expansion strategies. So there we will be more of a strategic uh, and operational uh, co-founder. And all of this, uh, there's a you know complementarity between the two, and all of this is 
uh, specialize, like I said, in uh, platforms and ecosystems, business models. And so uh, I had a nice slide saying, alone I go faster, together we go further. So you cannot see it, but <laughs> what we are, we're working as an alliance of experienced entrepreneurs and platform and sustainability experts across Europe. So it's an alliance of startup studios. And because there are many different uh, flavors of studios and for us, partnership um, is really a core value. So we, we, we have kind of build, uh, and I will explain to you how we build this uh, alliance over the years, but uh, we build this alliance that works really well. So like uh, uh, I mentioned when I was working in my uh, in big corporate companies, the, the core values there that I kind of, uh, you know, made mine were innovation. Of course, I was always working on uh, innovation from a market perspective, from a technology perspective, from a product perspective from a business model perspective and entrepreneurship also as funny as it may sound for, for, for a big corporate because um, for me it was like building something from scratch and I was always creating those projects with partners from scratch and this is where I realized that collaboration with partners, and sometimes we were talking about competition, in fact, but at the time, uh, but um, I realized that working with partners was bringing a lot of benefits and we, it was very rich, uh, much richer than um, working only, if I can say like that, with the, uh, the, my colleagues within the company always at the international level. And I realized very quickly that uh, if, you want, uh, if you want a partnership, you have to really have a win-win uh, perspective and a, a, trust, uh, a trusted relationship that you have to build uh, over time. So this is what I came with as uh, values when I created the studio. Now I'm going to tell you the little story about how I kind of created my uh, uh, my network or our network, if I can say uh, it's a better word. Um, so when I, I um, uh, created uh, my company, I wanted uh, to specialize in platform business models. And I'm talking about uh, 2018. So at the time, uh, there was not much talk about those models or, or they were not much understood. Is still quite uh, this, the, uh, true today, but less. And um, I, I realized I had to build some tools and methodologies that were specific to those business models if I wanted to really be efficient. And of course, you know, it seemed like a, a really huge task. And I looked around and looked on LinkedIn and I realized that there was one person in Europe who had actually started building a whole uh, set of tools specialized in, um, in platform uh, business models. And that was Matthias Walter, who's maybe on the call today. Uh, Matthias created the Platform Innovation Kit. And I thought, this is what I need. I'm going to reach out. So I you know, <laughs> reached out to Matthias, um, who thought, who's this French woman? Uh, who, what does she want? And um, we started exchanging. We realized that uh, uh, we had very... Uh, uh, aligned values, uh, the you know the values I just described below um, before, and we were very complementary also in culture, in in uh, character, in what we were good at, uh, and uh, so you know that, there was a, a good fit straight away. And I started using Matthias' tool, and then I found my first project. My first project was with La Poste in France. Once I had the tools, and I had found the tools in in my new network, I realized that I, I needed to, to deliver on that project, that I needed more arms, more people, right, to work with me to deliver the project. So again, reached out to Matthias, who helped me find uh, some French-speaking uh, people specialized or who understood uh, platforms. And we started building a small team to deliver the project to La Poste. Then once the project uh, progressed, we realized that we actually needed to create it and implement it, and we needed tech uh, skills. So that, that is about a, um, 
nine months before that, uh, a French guy based in Amsterdam uh, called Fabien, who might also be on the call, <laughs> which had reached out to me. He was himself looking for partners. And we again realized we were aligned. There wasn't any business together at the time, but we, we realized we were, uh, you know, well aligned in terms of values. So when I, then I realized I needed tech team, a tech uh, team and a venture lead for my uh, new startup, I reached out to Fabien and said, you know, are you interested? Can we collaborate? And so the, the team started to grow and we started working uh, and creating this, um, this uh, new platform in, in logistics. And then, you know, uh, as uh, we uh, drive uh, new projects and maybe we answer our RFPs or whatever, we realize that sometimes we need specific, specific skills like vertical skills. So, for example, at some point we needed logistics skills. So we reached out to a person in our network, also specialized in platforms and logistics. Uh, and the person is uh, um, based in uh, Copenhagen. And at the moment, actually, uh, we've also got uh, a, a project, a uh, potential project we want to, uh, an RFP we want to reply to, and uh, we need an en energy specialist. So we have reached out to other studios who might also be on this call. <laughs> uh, we've um, reached out to look for other studios who have references that we can together put forward because we've got some, but we need more to be uh, you know, more credible. Uh, to to the to the customer, and so then also um, you know through this journey, the fact that we have been working with a, a small uh, core of uh, different studios across Europe has it's helped us a lot on uh, you know best practices, defining together what works, what doesn't in terms of uh, offering, in terms of go to market, in terms of setup. It's been, uh, you know, also very rich to develop our own, uh, I mean, to develop each of our own uh, studios. Of course, there are some downsides just quickly, but I, I, I want to remain very positive. So I'm not going to talk too long about the downsides, but there are some, of course, which the first one is more uh, linked to the, I would say, preconceptions. Sometimes some customers take some convincing because they have like a list of criteria you have to fit into. Like, uh, I don't know, you've got to have uh, so many startups that have been through uh, uh, series A, B, C, D. You have to have so many people. You have to have uh, such a uh, balance sheet, blah, blah, blah. And if they are, sometimes they're stuck on it and then you can't move it. But most of the time, actually, they realize that uh, after talking to us that actually they want innovation. We also are functioning in a very innovative way and they, they realize the, the, the benefits it brings to them. Convincing customers and avoiding preconceptions and therefore sometimes being excluded by criteria from some RSPs can be some downside, but other than that, we haven't really found many downsides. In terms of benefits, we've got a great flexibility and adaptability because, like I said, when we need some specific uh, expertise or references or number of people, we're able to find it in our network and to use the right skills at the right time for the right amount, uh, uh, for the right budget. It enables us also to be very resilient and agile. Uh, for example, when uh, one studio in a country is um, maybe between two projects, has, you know, uh, is looking for some projects, then the other one can help out uh, and, and bring some more projects. So, you know, we're not very uh, uh, stuck with large costs of employees. It enables us also to choose our projects. You know, sometimes um, uh, there's a project in the in the network that comes up, and uh, you don't you prefer another one, so you don't have to work on it because it's uh, you know compulsory. Um, and uh, it means also we get great access to more uh, European customers. So, for example, uh, right now um, we are working with um, Swedish customers. Uh, with German customers, with French customers, uh, there's a whole mix. We are not constrained, if you want, to our local uh, local market. 
And so it's a shame I cannot share because I had the picture of our team um, that I wanted to show you all the <laughs> faces and the different places. Uh, so we've got London, Copenhagen, Amsterdam, Paris, Dresden, Marseille and Barcelona. And um, so we, we're not working the standard way, but that has been our strength so far. Uh, and since we are experts in ecosystems, uh, we try to work in the ecosystem mode, right? <laughs> and we're helping corporates uh, also innovate in business models. So we have to, you know, innovate ourselves in our models. So, uh, and generally our customers are not looking for the standard way they're, they're looking for, you know, innovative approaches. So I think that I don't know how long I took any, I, because I, <laughs> I'm a bit... Uh, <laughs> is good we fit into the time and also uh we we can share your presentation uh later uh when we publish the recording so don't worry people will still be able to see it good. thank you so much max do you have any questions i think now no <laughs> it was difficult for me so i was reading a bit of chat then switching back to the conversation so some technical uh, <laughs> from portugal are already waiting me for me to eat <laughs> Thank you so much, Natalie. So uh, I think uh, people will connect with you who are interested uh, in uh, connecting and as asking questions and also just uh, can ask you personally later. Thank you again for uh, pre presenting. And I want to say thank you to everyone, to all of our speakers, to everyone who is on the call live now still. <laughs> thank you so much. I want to remind you about our uh, Venture Studio family community. If you're wondering, uh, if you want to request details and access and membership plan, uh, please follow the link in the chat and we will send you the details as soon as possible. Also, if you want to contribute uh, to our uh, big Startup Studio Research 2024, please also follow another link in the chat. Also, all of the links will be in the follow-up email, so you wouldn't lose anything. Uh, so we've, we will be welcoming uh, your uh, help in the research as well. So thank you again. And now, as usual, let's all turn on our microphones and cameras and say thank you and goodbye. Let's do it today in different languages, since it's our Across Borders theme. Bye. 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 Bye.